Good. So uh, by, by way of introduction, I'll try to sort of give you a briefly a little bit of background. And uh, I want to keep this brief. We're running about 50 minutes late now with a little interruption. Uh, just to give you a little bit this idea of embodiment and, and you know, the scientific background of this, mm -hmm. um, this idea. So this workshop is about ultimately about cognition. But it's more about embodied cognition than about, let's say, the, 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 the abstract thinking that uh, we usually associate with cognition. So in that sense, it's more about soccer playing than chess. And you, you, you will recognize that um, soccer playing doesn't, is, is not emulated well by technical systems. Uh, robot soccer actually really sucks, as many of you will have noticed if you ever watched that. Um, while, uh, as you may know, chess uh, co programs are actually extremely good and have occasionally beaten uh, very, very much top players, even though they're very inspired by human cognition. Um, of course, chess playing is really also embodied because we do that quite well um, physically by moving pieces on a chessboard and we use the space, spatial layout, spatial representation to think about it. Uh, even people who uh, play chess uh, blindly use spatial representation, so there's some potential link to the sensory and motor surfaces in chess. And uh, the abstraction of chess as a purely computational thing is a special perspective on cognition. So I, w I wouldn't say that this is not about chess playing. In fact, I would say ultimately want to understand how chess playing works in humans by looking at how it is, for instance, grounded in a spatial representation of the scene. Uh, I, um, what I usually do here is take you through two examples, uh, uh, soccer playing and, and toaster repair, just to throw out some, some, some ideas uh, that are often So in, in soccer playing, I'm, I'm trying to make the argument that it's actually quite cognitive in nature. And cognitive because there is a lot of high level perception. I mean, you, you perceive the ball and, and the players and the scene, and of course that is not trivial if you recognize that every 300 milliseconds you're making a saccade. So on your uh, retinal surface you have a wild blur of images and in, in that sense just seeing that scene and being able to tr you know, uh, make it continuous is a non-trivial feat. You know, not at all trivial. If you're running around and you know, everything is bumpy um, you have to stabilize uh, the uh, visual array against um, some you know, motion that isn't easy to model. With a saccade, you could still think perhaps it's a 2D transformation and you could very effectively predict what will happen. But if you're running around on a bumpy surface, that's a challenge. And any of you who have seen uh, a camera uh, that by someone who runs, like some of this war footage we get these days where people run around, you see how, how jumbly the scene is. And when you're running yourself, you have actually a much more of a, a sense that the scene is stable. So the vision in uh, soccer is actually cognitive vision, high-level vision. It is not um, you know, low-level sensory motor as, as is the case in many of our robots. The, the you make dis decisions, perceptual decisions, you know, where to look, uh, what to pay attention, what to track. Um, that's a, sk a real skill. Uh, if you, there's this theme that you're embodied in the sense that you don't have to memorize everything. You can look around, look at the scene, but actually effectively looking uh, to pick up the information from the environment actually requires memory. Because if you were to have to make a visual search every time you're looking for something, that would be uh, impossibly uh, inefficient. So you actually have a pretty good idea where the goal and the ball and the other players are, and you're using that uh, information to guide your uh, looks, uh, to make them much more effective. And that actually requires some non-trivial coordinate transforms as well, as you might recognize, because now you uh, as accessing information that was on a certain uh, location on your retina from a different retina location, maybe even updated as you have moved around. So that's what, quite cognitive. And then, of course, your planning action. I'm not claiming that uh, this is a photo of my kids many years ago. I'm not uh, claiming they have very strategic plans, but they certainly uh, have to uh, select among different actions and uh, initiate actions, initiate a kick or not, and uh, um, uh, you know, coordinate the sequence of actions that they will be doing uh, not doing them all at the same time, having some competitive selection among actions and so on. And you see, you know, my boy looks fairly serious at how he's doing that, paying attention and uh, initiating perhaps a kick. And you can see how that is actually off the quality of which we usually think 
problem solving or goal oriented action is. Um, you, they're also getting better. Uh, pretty much you cannot avoid to get better on every scale, very short scale and then over the longer run. And uh, that characteristic of pervasive learning is, of course, one of the signatures of cognition. And then the subtle point that I always like to point out, uh, what we call background knowledge, Searle, John Searle emphasized that a lot, this idea that there is a lot of um, informal knowledge about uh, the environment that uh, you need to play soccer. In, in soccer, it's, it's, it's maybe more sensory motor, like how slippery the ground is and how hard uh, to kick and how hard to tackle, perhaps. Uh, they're also the rules of the game and understanding the goal of the game. In other areas, like um, I'm taking this toaster repair example because that's a classical example where um, information processing kind of approaches provide you with a flow chart of decisions that you have to make and that will be uh, really the most disembodied way of doing it. But um, if you look more closely at that, it has a lot of the same things. You have to visually examine the toaster uh, to do that, you, s you know, fixate in different locations. You will actually have challenging coordinate transforms. You, you're maybe you know, turning the toaster around, looking at it at different sides. And again, to then achieve something, you will have to be able to uh, predict where that screw that you once saw when you turn it around, where that actually is on the toaster. And that will be in a reference frame relative to landmarks on the toaster. And you will know on the side where the, let's say, where the engage knob is the screw on the bottom left of that side, that's the one I want to open. And that is a non-trivial coordinate transform to you know, apply that knowledge then to the sensory motor. Uh, that is actually not always easy, you might get confused about that sometimes. It's clear there that you're usually planning an action. Um, the, the kinds of actions you're planning are rarely like they are in the instruction. If you, even if you do IKEA uh, assembly, you know, which is very, very uh, detailed uh, how it is done, you will uh, notice that you're uh, uh, doing a lot more proximal um, action. You're actually using a lot of background knowledge, knowing that screws are to unscrew or to, or to screw, not just the direction of the screw, but also just this logic that you open a toaster first, that that's a good th first thing to do, for instance. But there's also sensory motor stuff in here, how hard to try to open a screw, how, to, how hard to press in, you know, what's normal, what's not. Uh, if, if a screw is very resistant, you might think, well, something might break, maybe it's sealed and so on. So there's a lot of background knowledge entering here. Um, I'll, I'll skip some of the other stuff, but <coughs> clearly it's also something where you learn. And uh, again, if you did, ever did an IKEA furniture and you bought three or four of one kind, then you will recognize how every time you're faster. And it's faster in terms of not having to look up the plan, but it's also faster in terms of every little action being smoother and easier and on. This is learning on a fast scale, right? This is not doing it the same the second time. That's one of the signatures of uh, embodied cognition in there. So in, if I summarize that in the abstract, uh, in, in embodied cognition we have typically active perception for a purpose. Uh, we have in some sense sensory autonomy that is not just passively uh, being driven by sensory input but by actively structuring it. We have um, that cognitive processes are linkable. They are not always linked to sensory input. You can sometimes do them from memory, but they're always linkable and updatable with current sensory information. And that's not a trivial constraint on a cognitive process. It has to remain open to updating. Uh, and in that sense, the abstraction and invariance that classical ways of thinking about cognition emphasize actually has to be understood. You know, a system that can all the time connect to sensory inputs um, is a priori vari variant that is connects the real visual uh, scene. It doesn't um, connect to an abstract, abstract description of the scene. And so how you actually achieve the abstraction that might be there for some purposes, for instance, for classifying the, the uh, holes on an IKEA board as being you know, one of five possible holes, and you know I have to put the screw into one particular one. And that's where you have to uh, be invariant against the particular pose, for instance, of that piece on your, uh, on your ground, let's say. Uh, how to achieve that then is actually uh, to be understood. Uh, learning uh, on, on all timescales ultimately, ultimately means that your cognition and action is uh, sensitive to context and that uh, can happen uh, also in real time on, on um, in just any moment uh, that what you currently bring to the scene uh, affects your decisions. Uh, 
uh, we take as a constraint uh, in, in this whole uh, approach, as a, a constraint that cognition is generated by nervous systems. That's of course not true on a robot, uh, but we're, we're using the, the principles of the nervous system to structure our thinking uh, as a source of constraint. Uh, that is, makes some problems hard, as you will know, and I'll uh, refer to that later in the uh, course. Um, nervous systems don't have pointers, you, you don't, not in an obvious way, you can't just take some information, put it in a processor, it's much easier to do that in a, in a digital computer, and that's a constraint uh, for generalization, for instance. But in other cases, it actually enables um, uh, parallel computation, for instance, in a very obvious way, so it can be in a feature as well. Uh, the background knowledge is, um, uh, an important constraints once you do em embodiment. You know, if you uh, if you have uh, abstracted and formalized knowledge, it's relatively easy to conceive of you know databases of prior knowledge. And uh, as you may know, expert systems, for instance, try to codify such knowledge. In uh, in an embodied uh, perspective, it's much harder to formalize that. When we built these robots, uh, the Breitenberg model I will be doing uh, in a moment is is about that. Uh, it's in our design decisions. There's a lot of background knowledge there. And it's sort of an analysis of behavior, of the, the, the structure of behavior and of the environment enabling behavior that goes into designing models and designing uh, robot systems. Can I ask a question? Yes. Can we ask questions? Yes, now? yes, okay. please. So I was thinking about the embodied cognition implies constraints, just that thing. It seems to me, shouldn't it be the other way around? that constraints implies embodied cognition. I mean, if you don't have constraints to act in the world, you can just do exhaustive search and, and, and look at all possibilities. It's the fact that you have resource constraints, cognitive constraints, uh, computational constraints, that makes, that gives you the need to, to do something else. And that's th that's that interesting, what, what yes. Cognition I can see how, where you come from, that one would put it that way around, I would say that's not common to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. That is, um, to th I think what you're suggesting is that there would be some abstract uh, challenging computational task mm -hmm. and that you would then say, well, the embodied system solves that in some way optimally or minimizes some computational cost or something like that. Uh, and that's an interesting thought that uh, maybe, you know, one could think maybe evolution in some way figured out how to solve after computation problems in efficient ways. It's certainly not uh, close to the practice mm -hmm. because in the practice, in, if you look at, at, let's say, an evolutionary perception, uh, perspective on cognition, then uh, the, the sensory motor comes first and the cognition is considered an achievement from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's very true in development, for instance. Sensory yeah, motor comes first and then cognition is sort of bootstrapped from there. Um, and uh, in, in that sense, uh, you, one w people consider the sensory motor a constraint that is that you have to work with what you have. Evolutionarily, for instance, we have to work with what we have. To think that there would be that problem and now we're approaching it with sensory motor mm -hmm. is an interesting theoretical thought, but it's, it's maybe not so connected to the biology of it. And evolution is really hard to say what came first. It's all a, it's a feedback loop. Well, in, in, in the sense, let's say in development, in the sense that um, sensory motor skills uh, reach maturity earlier than cognitive skills, for instance. Mm -hmm. Now you can say, for instance, I will be talking about perseveration in tomorrow, and um, perseveration is seen, you know, stops at about one year of age in sensory motor tasks, but in uh, things like uh, mental arithmetic, you can have it until adolescence. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of a typical cascade. So in that sense it's an empirical statement that sensory motor uh, is, is prior. Yeah, we can take this discussion yeah. offline. Right. This is a very interesting uh, different perspective. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should take away this uh, phone. It will interfere here. Good. Yeah, interrupt me for questions all the time, mm -hmm. by the way. I, I should have mentioned that. Um, so the embodiment hypothesis is an even more radical uh, thing. Uh, I just said you know, constraints, uh, human cognition is embodied and uh, you can think uh, through the consequences of that. 
But there are some people who say, well, that's all very good, but then there is real cognition somewhere up there, which is uh, abstract, which is mental uh, computation, which is perhaps language, simple manipulation, and um, that's really different and uh, freed itself of these uh, sensory motor constraints. Um, the embodiment hypothesis is that there is no such boundary, that, that it is all embodiment all the way through. It's a hypothesis in the sense um, I, I, that I wouldn't say it's currently not really scientifically clear if, uh, if that's true. Uh, I firmly believe it. I could say there is conversely very little evidence for such a boundary. It's actually surprising how little work there has been on uh, proving the invariance and the abstraction. It has very often been assumed. The one area that focused on that was categorical perception. And as you may know, it's actually very narrow. This is color and phoneme uh, perception were supposed to be categorical. If you look closely, it is not true. It's not really categorical. There's always additional information, metric information present. For instance, the uh, auditory feature space is informative about uh, exemplars within a category. It's not true that you're purely uh, judging just discrimination on categorical stimuli. That, that evidence that supported that was from old work which um, used artificial stimuli that were particularly impo impoverished in terms of uh, auditory features. This is just for those who know about that categorical perception. So there's very little uh, direct evidence for that. If you look into the brain, it's very implausible. In the brain, all the different areas involved in different level tasks look the same. Uh, if you do a high level task, you do, let's say, problem solving, language thinking, uh, sensory motor areas are active. There's no categorical difference between higher le level areas and lower level areas, uh, even also in terms of the coordinates forms. So the, one could say the, it's quite plausible, but it's, it's not a generally accepted hypothesis. I'm pushing, as one of the researchers in this field, pushing this um, hypothesis. Uh, uh, you will see in the, on the very last day of uh, the course on Friday, lecture on higher cognition, which shows sort of what, how we try to show that the, the kinds of theoretical concepts that address embodied cognition can address higher cognition. Okay, um, I already, uh, so, so neurodynamics, uh, I'll give you a deeper motivation about um, neurodynamics in a moment when I have a whole module about it. I just um, uh, anticipate that in some sense this signature of embodiment that I just reviewed uh, involves loops. It involves loops in the sense that you're creating some action and then you get consequences of that, for instance, sensory consequences that you shifted your gaze and you get a new stimulus or you moved and you, s you have a new perspective and so on and, and that will impact on your next decision. So that's an, an outer loop um, and loops require dynamics. I will prove that to you in a little while but it's maybe also intuitive. Uh, they require dynamics because you have some inner state and that state will be iteratively, uh, iteratively updated and that is what dynamical systems actually are. Iterative updating that ultimately happens in continuous time um, of some state variables. Um, it's actually also true that these kinds of loops are present even if a system is not in closed sensory motor loop. These would be then internal loops and that's where, we, uh, where the neurodynamics comes in. Um, so what we're uh, doing in this course is using neurodynamics as, l as the language, the mathematical language of neurodynamics as the language in which you understand cognition. So we'll be looking at a lot of diagrams like that where we have the rate of change of some variable u against a variable u uh, itself. That is the mathematical description of a dynamical system. It's a differential equation. We'll be going through that. You will see curves like that. and then. Uh, the, the uh, u variable, this will be the activation variable, will be this interstate variable that is studied in, um, in this time continuous dynamic systems perspective. And the particular variant of that will be dynamical field theory. Some of you already are quite familiar with that, where we'll be looking at continuously many variables like that. So along the fields, at every location of a field, there is one of those activation variables that has one of those equations. That differential equations. This will be then a uh, integral differential equation and the peaks of activation where there's some co uh, spatially continuous pattern of activation in a field like that. Those will be important elements of our language. The units of representation, they will be stable states, attractor states, and they can do 
selection decisions as here, and they will be uh, used to do detection decisions. And these decisions, when the cogni cognition comes in, those are mediated by instabilities. So I'm now, you know, that will be the stuff that we'll be talking about. So um, cognitive robotics is, uh, uh, a, uh, of course, it's its own field, has a lot of um, different approaches. Uh, robotics is, uh, within engineering, uh, a field that is um, inherently interdisciplinary. And that's one of the challenges of talking about uh, autonomous robotics. Um, you know, you have sensors, you have actuators, so you need control, you need some sensory information processing, uh, you know, data filtering and so on. But then you also have that cognitive layer, so you have some uh, uh, maybe uh, you know, vis cognitive vision, uh, recognition of objects, maybe estimation processes. You'll have some planning, uh, some form of logic. Uh, you need some scheduling for the processes, communication among different processes. Uh, all of that needs to be embedded in hardware, so you have uh, embedded computation, um, and you have mechanical engineering to get it all to be uh, mechanically stable. So from an engineering point of view, you see it's, it's very broad. A lot of different things uh, are added in there. That's why these soccer um, robot uh, festivals are very good training events, because you essentially ask engineering students to use all their skills. Um, it makes it also uh, conceptually somewhat confusing field because many different subdisciplines with their own theory style are combined. You will have people who just do logical programming, uh, maybe even AI style, uh, people who use uh, filtering ideas, uh, the control people use dynamical systems ideas, mechanical engineers also use sort of continuum time type ma uh, mathematics. Uh, all of that mixed in very, very many uh, projects in this area are uh, ultimately what they call hybrid systems. Hybrid is just a uh, noble way of saying it's a kludge. We just put everything together and somehow figured out how it works together. So that's a real problem in this field. Um, not everyone perceives it as a problem. You know, some people are just happy with that. A lot of engineers are happy with that. Um, we use this as a, an opportunity to think about that problem of how everything is brought together um, everything now meaning neural process accounts for the different components from perception through cognition to action, how they are brought together. And so that's a problem on in synthesis. And as you will know, uh, synthesis is actually a, a hard thing to do in science. Engineers, of course, are forced to synthesize in some sense, and principles of synthesis are important. But in, in science, it's actually, we're, we're much better at analysis that is at decomposing a system in diff into different components, which very often means proving that two things are different, discriminating, you know, showing uh, uh, that, that uh, under some conditions the system behaves differently than un under others, dissociating. In psychology, we often use that, that term. Uh, there's very clear paradigm for that. You, you, you know, just pred predict a difference and you then try to establish that difference empirically, and, and then you're happy. You have shown, again, there are two different things inside. But bringing them together and showing that they work together is much harder in the sense, what counts as evidence that you, that you achieved that? Now how do you prove that the synthesis you do is right? It's, it's hard. And uh, in our research program, we're actually using the robotics as a uh, heuristic <coughs> tool to do that. It's not. Uh, true that when we've built a robot that behaves reasonably with neurally plausible components, that that's a proof that that's how the nervous system does it. But as we put it together, we uh, are confronted with problems, and we can ask problems, uh, questions about these problems that we might be able to probe in the nervous system, and maybe sometimes see signatures, empirical signatures, of the way that our concept try to solve these problems, and that will be a topic. So in robotics, the autonomy aspect is this idea that the robot structures its behavior by itself. Uh, that means minimally it has its own sensor information to do that. And by itself, you know, so in some sense, uh, self-driven, self-organized intelligence and so on, as contrasted to purely pre-programmed and, and pre-planned. There's a whole spectrum for that. In some uh, engineering applications, a robot that has a little bit larger tolerance, for instance, 
where the pallet that it has to pick up can be shifted by a few centimeters. They already call that then autonomous. That's very limited autonomy, with a tolerance against sensory imprecision, because it has a camera maybe that updates the uh, position of where the pallet is expected. Uh, all the way to robots that would, uh, over the long run, uh, uh, you know, figure out how to solve problems. That will be the, the big goal, of course, of, of a lot of that work. In uh, our language, in uh, uh, neural dynamics autonomy also means that the processes unfold uh, in closed loop un under their own, um, you know, depending on their own state, and is then contrasted, to, for instance, to the input output picture that a lot of information processing thinking about the nervous system uh, implies. So, you may, you may know a lot of classical psychology models are about a system that receives an input, computes something on that, and gives a response. Formalizing a lot of the reaction or response time kind of paradigms where you just ask someone to react to a stimulus, to say yes, no, yes, you know, dif same, different, and so on. While then autonomy is a system in, in that perspective that would on its own do something, uh, maybe acquire the sensor information, maybe uh, select an action, uh, choose, choose an action. Of course, in many cases, we still give the system in some sense a task, and that just means that we constrain the range of behaviors to a smaller set that is somehow uh, compatible with the environment in which the system is. But within that limited set, we want the system to, on its own, generate activity and behavior. So that, that autonomy aspect is uh, one of actually the, the insights that we have derived from working with uh, robots um, and discover then as a constraint that a lot of uh, models that account for human behavior are lacking that sort of autonomy. Um, now, for those who really do serious robotics, I say that we do have that ambition to also really contribute to that literature. So sometimes uh, a nearly a plausible approach um, can be competitive with uh, approaches that just take from the toolbox. Engineers are very pragmatic when there's something neurally uh, grounded that works well. They're happy to take it as long as it's not too much overhead. Uh, in that sense, by definition, hybrid systems are superior because they take anything that works, so including very theoretically solid uh, things. Uh, in other cases, it can be um, a challenge, for instance, probabilistic uh, ideas are very uh, powerful right now in autonomous robotics. While their place in our theory are, isn't quite clear yet, and in psychology, probabilistic thinking has much more problematic aspects. I'll be happy to discuss that at some point. I, I don't have a module on that, but a lot of you might be challenged with that all the time because probabilistic thinking is so strong right now. Um, and, and so that's, a, uh, I think, a, a source of tension where one can ask oneself what role does probabilistic thinking play in the nervous system and, and how we do we emulate the successes of that approach in technical applications. Um, and I'll close this uh, module by, by giving just a little bit of some his historical markers. I usually did a whole uh, module on that by, uh, and, and anyone who knows wants to know more about that, I'll be happy to tell you. This is the sort of stuff that's not in papers. That's why I thought it was sometimes interesting to tell you. But I decided to reduce that a little bit because um, it comes before we even have the lecture course. But I thought it was important for you, given the, your background knowledge, to sort of dissociate three strands. There is dynamical systems thinking in psychology. There is uh, the attractor dynamics approach really in robotics. And somewhere in between there is dynamical field theory. And to position that a little bit, I'll give you a few uh, hints. So originally, a lot of these ideas come from psychology. In psychology, in the 80s, there was essentially connectionism. And one could say that neurodynamics, as it is now formulated in psychology, is sort of, I would say, connectionism done right. That is uh, the first step that was done in connection, which was essentially to have function emerge from neural processing models. The processing models emphasized greater distributed representations, so it went away from information. Uh, information processing, computer metaphor, to neural principles, uh, and, um, and then looked at the emergence of function from that with emphasis on very simple learning rules that were not autonomous, for instance. They were all somehow structured from the outside. The system is told, now learn, now don't learn, and so on. Um, and um, 
and largely input output. There were some recurrent networks, but it's still information uh, in, in sort of the basic paradigm of information processing. The system gets some input and then does something in response to that. And so what, what has been weak in that approach was essentially the autonomy, uh, generating uh, behavior by itself, creating its own stimuli, working in closed loop, essentially because you need dynamics to do that. Um, and this is also a reason why these systems have had a hard time interfacing with real sensors and real actuators. In fact, you will not see connections networks on robots unless they are essentially neural dynamics. Recurrent neural networks are often just neural dynamics not studied very well. So we came off that wave. This, this approach was sort of developed in parallel, but came, I would say, off that wave. And in psychology, there were people like Turvey, Kukler, and Kelso. I don't know if anyone knows these people who I was, they came from ecological psychology, uh, sort of an anti-information processing branch of psychology. J.J. Uh, Gibson was sort of the grandfather of that, emphasizing how much uh, cognition can be sim simplified by uh, taking account of the environment and having a limited behavioral repertoire. I would say that that approach has its strong limits, but some of the ideas came from that in a very metaphorical way. People were using the harmonic oscillator as a as sort of a, uh, a metaphor for a lot of uh, behavior generation. I think that it's mostly science fiction, sort of thinking about how things could be. There are very few results that have remained to be, to be really solid. Um, w working with Scott Kelzer, I was actually one of the, the people who came in coming off that stream. We tried to make things a bit more operational and, and sort of testable. So, so one, one story I'll mention is that in movement coordination, we discovered essentially that stability is an important concept. Stability I'll define formally in the, the, the afternoon lec lecture, but it is um, uh, actually in the, in the second lecture now. Uh, but it is um, uh, it's a concept of sy dynamic systems thinking. And we did this coordination story. Anyone knows this? The finger movement coordination, you know that? Anyone else knows this? No? Yeah, you, you also know that. So probably the engineers don't know that so well. Um, it's a model system for movement coordination that you see in, you know, gates, trot, gallop, things like that, walking. So it's the relative timing of movements. It was actually reduced to finger movements because that minimizes the mechanical constraints and uh, minimizes spatial constraints on s in though it's odd. This, this very un uncomfortable form is actually the nicest because you get rid of some other stuff. And then you have essentially the in-phase and anti-phase pattern of coordination of rhythmic movement. These are the two basic patterns. Everywhere, you know, in walking you alternate, in gallop, for instance, you have synchrony. Essentially sort of uh, excitatory coupling makes in-phase, inhibitory coupling makes anti-phase, so you get these two patterns. They're not always exactly those. Those are universal, you can see them pretty much everywhere in uh, rhythmic movement generation systems. And uh, <coughs> the phenomenon is that they ha don't have the same stability. If you start out in antiphase or alternation, this would be this sort of pattern, anatomical an alternation, right? And the muscles alternate that are homologous. Then uh, if you speed up, you switch to in phase. Uh, so you ultimately you switch to that. Uh, you, m you will know a version of this if, if you do uh, coordinate with a metronome, then you. Uh, uh, anti-phase is syncopation, like in jazz, right? And if the frequency is high, then it's hard to do and people tend to fall into in-phase. That's sort of a, a similar phenomenon. Uh, that's well known and the, the operational step was to recognize that that switch means that the anti-phase pattern loses stability and that shows that it had stability before and that stability is an important property. Um, and, and here's, this is a, a measure of this timing. And you see there's pretty much constant then it switches. So you don't see in the pattern itself that it's going to switch. But if you analyze its stability, you can predict when it will switch. And stability can be analyzed very simply by, for instance, just estimating the variability in time, the fluctuations in time of a measure of the timing. Relative phase is really just the offset in time of events normalized by the cycle. And you can do that cycle by cycle, and then you can see how fluctuations of the various standard deviation increase before the point of switching. The switch occurs here. So you can see the stability being lost. A more sophisticated way is uh, to perturb uh, 
the pattern, you can actually mechanically perturb the finger by some force exerting on the finger. And then look how quickly it takes, uh, how fast the pattern comes back, how quickly you return to the correct pattern. And that time increases before the switch as well. This is the so-called critical slowing down. So these are two signatures of a loss of stability, which mean that when you see, look at the pattern, stability is a hidden property of the pattern. Uh, now, in, in neurobiology, these sort of things have been studied for a long time, and people typically would record the pattern of some neural structure, for instance, of a, of a, a ganglion uh, in, in the spinal cord or in, in vertebrates, and um, just have a few cycles to show what kind of pattern it makes, and then say, you know, this is responsible for that pattern, this is responsible for this pattern, and never analyze the stability of these patterns. Um, but these kind of uh, results show that uh, the stability is actually necessary for the emergence of the pattern. If you don't have stability, you won't, won't see it. The same neurons are there, but they can't do the pattern if it's not stable. It's also sufficient. That is, if you have the mechanism to stabilize a pattern, the pattern emerges. So you don't need more than just stability. So it's a shift from saying, I have to account for the pattern, to saying, I have to account for its stability. And as you will find in the lectures, uh, accounting for its stability really means accounting for its dynamics because the dynamical system description is actually what makes stability operational. Yeah. So that's a first hint in that history that we really needed dynamical systems. We, uh, uh, meaning a sort of a group in which I was involved, um, extended these ideas then into what we thought was cognition then, very simple kinds of cognition. For instance, we looked at saccades the selection of saccades uh, at movement preparations or selecting one of different possible different movements. And then we did a lot of work with John Spencer on spatial memory and feature memory and things like that uh, with these kind of ideas. And, and to do that, we had to add an ingredient, which was somehow representation, this when activation variables came about and so on. And we used these uh, neural field equations that we'll be discussing a lot in this course that have a longer history. They go back to Wilson Cowan and Amari. We often cite that to the 70s. But actually, the way conceptually we're using these equations is quite different from what the originators of these models thought. So we came from this ecological thinking. Instabilities are important uh, to analyze you know, the underlying factors and looking at the emergence of behavior from pattern, from these psychology ideas. Um, well, these people were driven by biophysics of, of the brain and were modeling cortical layers. And they discovered instabilities and new patterns emerging from instabilities, uh, which at the time was odd. This was the time of Hubel and Wiesel. Hubel and Wiesel was essentially information processing, input-output, characterizing the input-output mappings, and uh, was very successful that way. And here these people were looking at patterns that arise from mathematical models of cortex that are not dictated by input and output. They were making, for instance, spontaneous oscillations that were not in the input. Um, and so in the end, these models were largely used to model epilepsy, uh, hallucinations, literally, because uh, patterns of activation without input, call that hallucination. Um, behavior of these systems under drugs. Somebody was, you know, when you take LSD, apparently you have some funny patterns on your visual array, and then say, oh, look, the model behaves just like a person under LSD. Uh, very odd stuff. So it remained without influence for a very long time. And uh, a couple of people, Thomas Trappenberg was one of them, and, and us, and a couple of other people, started to give some new meaning to that in the mid-90s or late 90s, really as uh, a language of cognition, that is, as n which literally means some behavior without not, that's not stimulus-driven, that's not dictated by the input. And now that was welcome. Now it didn't, wasn't uh, hallucination, it was actually making decisions. A decision means that uh, you have the same input, but you have different outputs. You decide to look left or right, same stimulus, but, but something inside you makes a difference, and that's what the Neurofits the interactions, if you assume. I'll introduce you into that. So that, uh, that came uh, about 10 years after the, th this other work that I previously mentioned. Um, as we did that, we did that a lot in develop developmental settings. That actually has some logic to it. I will be reviewing this NLP work tomorrow. 
um, essentially infants can do sensory motor decision making very well. When you do that with adults in the lab, it's quite difficult. If you don't tell them what to do, then they come up with some strategy. They think you always should take the biggest or the largest of the one on the left. Or, uh, they, because you, you don't have that whole cognitive system around and you can't easily um, eliminate higher levels of cognition that use the same principles but that are harder to study. Infants, you can do that a lot and you can see how capacity to make decisions and to stabilize decisions and to ultimately build working memories emerge with experience. So it's actually um, not, by not by chance that uh, th that's where the, the, the methods were um, successful first. And there was a whole program looking at that and I'll review that a little bit in this course. Um, the robotic version of this uh, developed actually somewhat independently, I must say, so even though I was also involved, uh, somehow mentally took a, took a while for me to see the connection. So I developed with, my, uh, with Michael Dose in 92 the attractor dynamics approach that I will be reviewing uh, as we move to, to lunch. Um, it's initially a little bit different. It uses attractors at the behavioral level, not at the activation level. And um, it used instabilities to uh, make decisions. It's related to the potential field approach. Roboticists will know the potential field approach, right? How, how many of you know the potential field approach? A few, right? And so it's sort of the idea of the potential field approach, except that in the potential field approach, the behavioral plan is to move to the attractor. So it's a transient. While we designed uh, systems where at all times you're sitting in the attractor. The attractor moves, but you're sitting in the attractor. It's essentially a question of whether your variable is the position, then the movement is you know, to the attractor, or is it velocity? If you're, if, you ha if you're an attractor for velocity, then you're driving around while you're sitting in the attractor. And I'll show you how that works in that, that lecture. And that gives a lot of power to the approach because now the bifurcations of the attractors are the decision points. And so the only thing you need to design are the attractors. You don't need to design all the transients, which is much harder to design all the transients to fulfill constraints. And as you may know, the potential field approach has these problems that there can be undesirable trajectories somewhere. And um, it's a heuristic approach. And the exact version of it, the navigation function, is, is pretty much unpractical. unpractical. Um, and, and the attractor approach, in that sense, is much more, um, much, e much easier to, to control and design. And you'll see that. In, in that early uh, robotic work, we actually introduced fields, dynamic fields, and we actually personally, in our own history, is that we discovered the fields through the robotics. Uh, but you know that's just our history of thought. So we quickly saw that when we wanted to use these attractor dynamics with real sensor information, we had to make um, essentially normalization on the sensor information. You can imagine if you have a robot that avoids obstacles, and if you get a lot of readings for a distance on one side, but it's all redundant, and you have a lot of repulsion from that uh, direction, um, and the same on the other side that you, you might overlook a small obstacle in the middle but that you still want to avoid. So you have to somehow normalize that they are not all, no, not every sensor reading gets the same, same vote and then you end up with a representation. You essentially, you select representatives. And we did that initially with some self-made dynamics and then we discovered neural fields and we did that with fields. So we had fields make peaks that represent characteristic ob obstacles and we didn't to sort of summarize sensor readings into representations of obstacles. That was also about the same time, the mid-90s. And then in robotics, we moved to using these neural dynamics essentially to do algorithms. You know, when you uh, program robots' uh, behavior, usually people do logic, you know, if this, then do that, and so on. And we wanted to get rid of all that and do it th through pure neural dynamics. And we had a system that would sequentially activate different behaviors and and, and have uh, coded into its coupling structure the logic of that behavior, like put objects into particular spots and so on. And this is what we now call behavior organization. You'll have a lecture about that. We use now a different framework than we did originally, nicer equations that are simpler, that are nearly actually more consistent. Um, in the late 90s, we uh, redid the whole thing with low-level sensor information. Previously, we had essentially used these 
representation. Here we try to use very simple sensors. Frankly, part of it was driven by the fact that I moved to Marseille, a very poor lab. I had a very simple robot only, and I wanted to see if I could still use the stuff. But there's also some real scientific point we connect, collected to behavior-based uh, approaches in robotics. The roboticists may know about that, you know, Rodney Brooks, behavior-based uh, approaches. And so we were able to show with these um, very simple systems, like this one has only five distance sensors, of which only four actually contribute. And with that, is able to avoid obstacles. And then we had, had some light uh, dependent uh, resistors and can go to light sources. And this wheelchair, which is much more sophisticated, actually has the same sort of thing. It has a lot more, but very simple infrared sensors. It has no knowledge about the, the environment, no plan, and so on, but can still move uh, surprisingly well. And I'll show you why in a, mo in a little while. Um, and it actually is a real practical approach to an autonomous wheelchair. That was done in Marseille. Um, and, and that's actually when we did put dynamical fields onto robots. I'll show you that again tomorrow. It's a vehicle that goes to sound sources, and the music is the sound source. And it actually has a field on it. It builds a peak at the target location uh, that makes decisions, for instance, to ignore the echo, which it initially got stuck on, but now it ignores the echo and goes to the target. I'll show you that tomorrow. So this was low-level sensor information, just five microphones, and with fields making these representations that could ultimately stabilize uh, decisions. So it's what we did earlier with the obstacle, but there we had uh, a map, for instance, on which we worked, here with, uh, with low-level sensor information. And that's a much better metaphor for, for what nervous systems do. In the meantime, we do much more complex things. Uh, we, we do multi-degree of freedom coordination. We have a whole experimental program on that. We have some uh, robotics on that. I decided in this course to cut that. We only have this learning, the sequence generation, but where the arm control is sort of a black box. Um, it requires other mathematics, and uh, it was just something that took too long. I hope if, if anyone seriously wants to work in that direction, we can talk and make a project in that direction. Um, sequence generation is a, a real need if you go to, to more cognitive um, uh, kinds of systems. And sequence generation is uh, you know, trivial in an algorithmic information processing approach. You just say, you know, if, then, else, or, or say, first do that, and then do this. You have a, you know, in the code, you can have a sequence. In a dynamical system, if everything is one big dynamical system, that's much harder if we're saying, Attractor states are the behavioral states. Attractor state, you stay in the state. You know, why would you ever go to another state? You actually have to make the state unstable to switch to another state, and you have to organize that. And so that was a, a real challenge for us for a while, and Julia Zanimiska developed an approach for that uh, that's um, based on the condition of satisfaction. It's a, an idea that we actually copied from John Searle, a philosopher who verbally analyzes behaviors. So very interesting to us that he had such a good sense for the need for, for that thing, conditional satisfaction. And we're using that to induce instabilities to systematically move from one state to the other. And Matthias Richter will teach about that uh, tomorrow afternoon. He has to leave on Wednesday, so we shifted that lecture a little earlier, even though it's a little bit advanced in topic. And the other thing, uh, I think it's this thing with these movies, uh, oops. I sometimes my program gets stuck on these movies. I'll switch by hand. Um, the other thing you will be seeing is to move then toward cognitive vision, toward perception. We'll have two presentations on that. Uh, Stefan Ziebner will review the scene representation system where a system scans the scene uh, with covert shifts of attention and brings an object into the foreground, enters that into a memory. These will be peaks of activation in ultimately in a three-dimensional field. And Oliver Long will review a system that um, recognizes the objects that are foveated or, or attended to uh, with a uh, feedback loop system that recognizes them and also estimates their pose. And then the system fuses that by having the third dimension, essentially the label dimension. And uh, all of that is just one big dynamical system. And uh, one of the advantages of that is the fact that it's continuously linked to sensor information. So, so you'll see how, for instance, when you shift stuff around, scene input shifts, therefore these peaks here move. Uh, 
And without any recognition, there's no recognition going on, you keep track of where what is because you drag the label along. That's sort of the philosophy of in body cognition, right? That you actually use here a sensory motor essentially tracking to update your scene and in that updating you don't actually need to engage the cognitive vision anymore. Uh, and then we'll have uh, this, this lecture on Friday will show how far we push this. This is then a project that was actually initiated by uh, Julian Sandemiska with uh, John Lipinski and Sebastian Schneegans. It's about uh, spatial relationships Spatial language is sometimes considered sort of a core module of language. And uh, so the system is about doing something like uh, saying, you know, what is to the, the right of the green object? And the answer is supposed to be the blue object. For instance, here on top you see the blue is now active. Did this run already? Um, I think there's some way of how I can, yeah, rerun that. So you see a simulation in which um, you bring in the information green, it finds that that's the target object, and then you boost, I think you bring in to the right off, and then you just boost these things here, and this is supposed to select autonomously uh, that it's the blue object, and it's the blue object that is, I believe, here to the right. This here is a peak, I believe, or here's a peak. That's, that tells the, the reference object and the, the code. So it's a grounding of a relational phrase like that in a system that's connected to the actual camera scene. That, that's sort of what we consider higher cognition, a system that can autonomously do that. Uh, there's work uh, on, um, related work on uh, imitation, action understanding, cooperation that's done in, um, where, where is he? Yeah, here, in, in Guimarães, Estela Bichu, and Wolfram Erhagen, who happen to be former students of mine who have taken uh, uh, that route and have a whole research program on that. And they also have a research program on cooper robotic cooperation, on how multiple robots can interact through dynamical systems to bring about uh, collaborative tasks, for instance, to transport an object together. Uh, they sometimes contribute to the summer school. We did it at their lab uh, th three years ago. Uh, and we then had modules and exercises on, on that. This year we, we didn't do that and so we don't have projects on that because that's really their know-how. Okay, so uh, this is my introduction and what I'll do right now, um, I think we have a br coffee break, but uh, after the coffee break I'll, uh, uh, I have to check if that's actually true. Uh, I'll do this Breitenberg vehicle module um, and I'll follow that by uh, an uh, attractor dynamics module. The Breitenberg uh, vehicle module is very, very brief and um, that shows you um, the essentially how neural dynamics and behavioral dynamics relate, how, how, what these two really are. And in the course then we'll first do the behavioral dynamics. This is sort of the control-like dynamics that will be the attractor dynamics module. And this afternoon I'll then give you a module on neural dynamics. Um, and that will be just one neuron and then two neurons. That's the maximum we do. And you will see that a lot of what dynamical field theory, the dynamical field theory is infinitely many neurons, right? Um, and we go from two immediately to infinitely many. Uh, and you will see that the sorts of things that we can do with two neurons actually uh, un make you understand almost everything that happens with infinitely many neurons. Uh, the, the step to infinitely many neurons is important because when you have one or two neurons, you know, they stand for something, and there's a real question of how, can they, how, how come they stand for something. And, and, and that requires this embedding in underlying dimensions. Then you can understand how they stand for something. And you will find that in the end, the one or two neurons that we studied are really one or two peaks. And they can be in different locations in the field, and we describe the peaks by some activation variable. It's actually not really neurons. That, that will turn out in the end. And so that will be the uh, lecture tomorrow morning.